Welcome to part 5 of our series on the common fallacies committed by both the religious and the pro-government. This week, we look at the argument from incredulity, also known as the argument from ignorance. This is where someone asserts his claim has been proven because there is no evidence to the contrary. Here are some common examples. I saw something in the sky, and I don't know what it was, so it must have been an alien spaceship. My cancer went away, and my doctors don't know how. It must have been because I prayed. You can't prove that vaccines don't cause autism, so until we know, we need to be on the safe side and not vaccinate. Here's an example from a rather shameful period in American history. You must be a communist, because you can't prove that you're not. If this sounds like a shifting burden fallacy, like what we talked about back in part one, well, you're right. But there's another element of it, too. And that's been summed up by the common phrase given by many a woo. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Well, it certainly isn't evidence for your claim. At best, it means we should withhold judgment. But not only that, sometimes absence of evidence is evidence of absence if we look where the evidence should be and it isn't there. It also tries to avoid the unlikelihood of their premise, or at least the superior likelihood of alternatives. Let's say it's 1947 and you're in the town of Roswell, New Mexico. You see something fall from the sky. You run to check it out, but before you get there, lots of military guys pull up in jeeps and grab you and take you away somewhere. So now you're at the table with the light over it, and they're asking you questions about what you saw and how much you know. Once they're satisfied you've told them everything, they let you go, but warn you that if you talk to anyone about it, you'll be arrested or even killed. That night on the news, you see a story saying that what fell from the sky was a weather balloon. But, you think, why would the military be that concerned about a weather balloon? So when someone suggests it was really an alien spaceship, and the military was covering up, do you believe them? Well, yeah. Why else would the military have reacted that way? Well, if it were an alien spaceship, yes, you'd expect the military to react that way. But is that the only reason? What you need to think of is the likelihood of an alien visitation absent your experience. This is called prior probability. And if the prior probability is low, you need a lot of evidence to overcome it. Or, as Carl Sagan said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. But you don't know what it was. So what? That doesn't mean your set of evidence is enough to overcome prior probability. And how do you feel after Congress passes the Freedom of Information Act and we find out it was a spy balloon trying to see if the Russians were doing high-altitude tests of nuclear weapons? Sounds like another cover story to me. Ah, but how did you know the weather balloon story was a cover? Because the evidence didn't fit it. But if it were a spy balloon, what would you expect? You'd expect the military to question you to find out what you knew, and release you after threatening you if you talked. Exactly the same evidence that led you to conclude it was aliens. But the spy balloon hypothesis has a much higher likelihood than aliens, especially for 1947. And think about this. Before, when that explanation wasn't available to you, you thought aliens because you couldn't think of anything else it could be. But now, looking back, you can see that you should have considered one other alternative. That you didn't have enough information to get the real answer. Anytime you're faced with something like this, where you can't think of an alternative, remember that. It just might be that if you were in possession of all the facts, an alternative hypothesis would be obvious. Probably the biggest example in religion is known as the God of the Gaps argument. Remember this guy? Tide goes in, tide goes out, you can't explain it. Yes, I can. Tides are caused by the moon's gravity. Okay, but how did the moon get there, pinhead? See, you fill one gap, they just jump to the next. And it doesn't even matter that we've got a pretty solid model explaining how the moon formed. They can just jump to something else. Any hole in our knowledge would do. Creationists do this all the time. You don't have a missing link between apes and humans. Well, humans are apes. 
So I'll interpret this to mean between humans and our last common ancestor with chimpanzees, say Helanthropus. And we do. There's Australopithecus africanus. Well, now you have two gaps. One between, say, Helanthropus and Australopithecus africanus, and one between Australopithecus africanus and Homo sapiens. You now have two missing links. No, they've been filled. In fact, between, say, Helanthropus and H. sapiens, we have Ardipithecus, Australopithecus amanensis, A. afarensis, A. africanus, Homo habilis, H. erectus, H. heidelbergensis, and H. rhodesiensis. But that's... Eight missing links you have to fill. See how it works? Each gap you fill in just creates two more. This happens all the time with origins. You don't know how life started, so it must have been done by God. Remember what we said earlier? What's the alternative you should always consider? Uh... I don't have enough information to get the real answer? See? You're learning. Lots of scientists have theories of abiogenesis that are being tested and refined. Any one of these has a greater prior probability than God, and even before we had any idea about any other possibility, there's still the possibility that no one has the information to get the right answer. Yet. Just like with the Roswell aliens. Maybe God did it, or maybe you just don't have enough information to reach the right conclusion. I think we both know which one has the higher prior probability. So how do statists engage in the argument from incredulity? Do I have to do it again? But who will build the roads? As we've discussed previously, the fact that you can think of who will build the roads does not mean they won't be built, and it certainly doesn't mean the government will build them better. And this is far from the only question. Who will feed the poor? Who will put out fires? How will you stop crime? What will stop people from dumping toxic waste into our rivers? And just like with the theists, it's you can't explain it. Even if I can't, so what? That doesn't mean you win by default. As discussed in part one, that does not absolve you of your burden of proof. All it does is speak to your lack of imagination. It's government of the gaps. In fact, it's hard to think of any statist arguments that don't comprise an argument from incredulity in some way. They really can't imagine how this can be achieved through peaceful, voluntary cooperation. But this itself raises an important question. Do you really trust someone who knows so little about a subject to control it through the use of force? Not only that, it shows a complete inability to think about things in any way other than imposing one solution on others. They're essentially asking, So what one solution will you force on others? As pointed out in Part 4, we don't have our own way that we want to impose on others. We don't have direct answers for these questions, not because we can't think of any answers, but we can think of lots of possible answers, and we want people to have the freedom to explore which solution works for them. Maybe some private roads will be toll roads. Maybe some residential roads will be built by a homeowners association, as many are today, in fact. Maybe roads in a business park will be paid for by the businesses who want customers to have easy access to their stores. Sit and brainstorm. I'll bet you can think of a dozen different possibilities. Which way is best? The libertarian doesn't claim to know. We just aren't that arrogant. And that's really what this fallacy is all about. Arrogance. Whether you're talking about God or government, the essence of the argument from incredulity is this. If I can't think of an alternative, there must not be one. But whether you're a statist or a theist, you have to stop and think that maybe you're just not clever enough, or don't have the right experience, or don't have as much information as you need to see alternative solutions. And once you learn to have the humility to see that this option just might have a higher prior probability than the status solution you're advocating, you put yourself in a much better position to discuss libertarian and market-based approaches to all of these problems. Stay tuned.